So it's my very great pleasure to introduce the speaker for this evening, uh, Fiona Cloud SC. Fiona is a senior counsel practicing at the Victorian Bar in Public and Commercial Law. She is the chair of the Accountability Roundtable, the former co-chair of the Open Government Forum and chair of Transparency International. Uh, she's also the chair of the International Bar Association Diversity Council. She's past president of the Law Council of Australia and the Australian Bar Association and was chair of the Victorian Bar and president of Australian Women Lawyers. You think that would be enough, so let's continue. <laughs> she's been recognised with numerous awards for excellence and leadership for her work in supporting diversity and equality, the advancement of women and her work in pro bono and human rights matters, including human trafficking. And in 2018, she was awarded the Australian Woman Lawyer of the Year Award. Fiona uh, was inducted onto the Victorian Honour Roll for Women in 2014, was a recipient of numerous professional awards, including the prestigious inaugural Commonwealth Government Anti-Slavery Australia Freedom Award, which she then was able to award to her own colleague, Kate Van Dore, only a few years ago as well. Um, and that was for her work representing victims of human trafficking in area that paid for work in country. We've got a lot to talk about. Uh, and raising awareness and contributing to law reform and policy on this issue. Uh, in 2019, you might recall that Fiona was also a candidate for Labor in the federal election, um, but was shortened and didn't do any favors, unfortunately. So <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, she would have. Um, yeah, well, in a way, we're glad that that came as it did because it may have been too busy to, to come along tonight if it hadn't. Uh, but look, I've had the, the privilege and pleasure of hearing Fiona speak at the Australian Women Lawyers Conference last year down in Sydney, and uh, we're really in for a treat, although I suspect we'll be quite challenged uh, by uh, what we're about to hear. So, Fiona will be speaking on Me Too, or Sound and Fury, or Signifying Something. Um, where she really asks the question, do we harness the potency of the nature movement to create real time? So get all join me, so you can welcome in Fiona. Thank you very much, Mr. for putting that gloss on my recent failure. It's always a, a, a um, mostly great fun thing to do. So, um, I, um, and partially regretful and partially happy that I'm here in this capacity instead. So thank you very much. Uh, Your Honours and distinguished guests, uh, Nadir, congratulations, fabulous outcome. Um, I feel like to be facing the other way. I'll have it so hard here, but can I begin by uh, thanking Auntie for her beautiful welcome to country on behalf of the terrible people, the beautiful song, and just touching so briefly on the history of dispossession and the rich history that she herself um, has in her family line and acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet, paying my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I would particularly welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here tonight. Um, I'm delighted today to present this lecture to honour the contribution of the late Professor Michael Wintop and I welcome Shelley particularly uh, and his contribution to the development of legal um, scholarship. I'm indebted to Charles Sanford who uh, shared with me his tribute to Professor Winkoff so that I could understand some of um, his personal qualities and in particular um, I was very struck by the tribute to his meticulous work, his extraordinary com accomplishment as a researcher and a teacher and his very dry wit. And I'm sure he would have enjoyed the challenge of the topic that I'm speaking on today. So, um, can I start with a confession? In respect of this topic, I am a little jaded. But I will summon some enthusiasm because the next generation demanded of, of us. The topic of Me Too, All Sound and Fury, signifying something, with apologies to the Bard reflects my experience of 30 years of advocating for change in respect of um, the evidence and the existence of um, patterns of conduct of bullying and harassment in the legal profession particularly, which have been confirmed in numerous surveys and studies. We now know that sexual harassment is a thing in the legal profession that requires a system-wide response. And not only is it a thing for lawyers, it's a thing for our society. Apart from some tinkering around the edges and some very high profile defamation cases where the women didn't actually consent to being um, dragged into the process, it appears that we are socially and culturally 
in it at dealing with the topic I'm unable to do with it. And I reflect that no doubt this, this reflects our deeply entrenched acceptance and dependence even upon gender inequality in our society. We do know about the persistent and an inexplicable pay gap that translates into and compounds into inequity and financial insecurity over women's lives. With women lawyers, just to focus on my own profession for a moment, facing staggering pay gaps from even their first year in practice. For barristers, the ATO data reveals the pay gap after adjusting for differential hours work, so that is a readily adjusted figure, persists at 147%. Now that number is just staggering when you think that we are increasing in terms of our numbers of senior barristers, but the way it persists and uh, the, the fact that it persists is inexplicable. We do know women are trusted generally in our society in low paid or volunteer care roles, but it's perplexing to contemplate how this translates into the commercial firm environment or the bar unless there is at least some sort of information asymmetry operating. We do know that women continue to press for inclusion amongst leadership roles, with women in the law making up around 25% of partnerships and around 10% of senior advocate roles despite making up for at least uh, at probably 30 years 50 to 60 percent of law graduates and new admittees. So if you look at that raw statistic that women are leaving the, the, the law schools in those numbers and topping, topping the grades, um, what are we doing to them that they are suddenly not there in the leadership roles in the course of their history? And if you spin a debate around like, and, and frame it like that, we must be doing something to let them down because otherwise we would naturally see that pipeline that we were promised 30 years ago would be inevitable. And the lawyers are no different. While the AS6200, the um, Australian Institute of Company Directors and Government, have moved to target women on boards, for example, and on courts, many companies still claim that they have to choose directors on what they call as merit, in other words, this, this accumulation of opportunities basically to present a, a, a glossy CV, and those appointments to the boards will happen to be men. They have small success where those boards do press for quotas. And this is despite the fact that we have also known for a decade that the business case for diversity has been well established. Companies we know have demonstrated productivity gains when two or more women are added to boards because naturally you enable people to avoid groupthink and the culture of don't lock the boat. So we've had national plans in the law and we've had um, shocking revelations for years now and still the bad behaviour persists, creating unsafe and unwelcoming workplaces for women. These are places that I'm describing where women don't know if they'll turn up to work and feel frightened, if they'll be distressed, or if they'll be assaulted just for turning up to work. And it's hard to believe that that could be happening in a professional environment, but it is. The International Bar Association recently conducted a global survey called Hashtag Ask Who, and the results demonstrate bullying and harassment are rife globally in the legal profession. 7,000 members of the global profession were surveyed across 135 countries and a thousand of those responses came from Australia. Half of all women and one third of all men responded reporting bullying. One third of all women reported sexual harassment. And those results reflect very closely the results of the Law Council National Attrition and Retention Survey that I um, designed in, 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 over four a few years ago. Another survey is now underway in Victoria Commission by our Legal Services Commissioner which seeks to set benchmarks and more detail around the nature of that harassment. So, surely it is time for drastic action. On the 24th of October 1975, 90% of the women of Iceland held a mass day of protest, protesting against wage discrepancy and unfair employment practices. Within 12 months, Iceland had passed new laws guaranteeing equal pay, and Iceland and other Scandinavian states now claim to be at the forefront of gender equity 
and the broader diversity debate. For our part in the law, we have laws that prohibit this conduct, we have rules, national conduct rules, we have commitments and broad statements from the professional and the professional bodies, we have action plans on conscious bias training, speeches and more speeches. We have champions and awards for excellence and still the conduct exists. So, more than 40 years after that strike in Iceland, in late 2017, we saw the Me Too phenomenon explode on our consciousness. As women, particularly in the film industry, shared their stories of sexual assault and harassment across social media platforms. And at the heart of this movement, and what seemed to generate such an immediate and heartfelt response, was something of an explosive rage that women continue to be exposed to unwelcome advantages, discrimination and violence in all walks of life. There was also a relief that their, public, that their stories were being made public and that they were sharing them publicly out of a claim of your, out of a cloud of your life of stigma and shame and also a longing for the fulfilment of the promise of fairness and equality. The stories were all too familiar for those of us who'd worked towards improving the lots of professional women, me and my sphere in the law, but others also in the media, in medicine, in sport, in acting and in the military. And we've heard them recently in the papers in the case of air traffic controllers and according to the EA Commissioner's report to Victoria and the EA Commissioner's report delivered yesterday in Victoria in our police force. The stories are well recognised by those working with victims of family violence as symptoms of deeply entrenched behaviours and beliefs. And yet, as horrible as these stories are, they've been insufficient to generate long-term change in our workplaces, our communities and our homes, especially for vulnerable women. Now, some point to the fact that the law in particular is the unionised or a never unionised workplace and the persistence of inequality uh, continues because of the correlation between the lack of um, an adequate voice in the workplace to point out inequality and the sense of conduct, which intrinsically makes sense, just as it is to nominate persistent gender inequality as our society, society is a cause. Now for me it's not just a cause, it's also a context. For nearly 30 years I've been working with my bar, with um, all of the bars, law firms and law societies to address systemic inequality in the legal profession. Now some of you might count that as an abject failure but we're still talking about this. But despite the many advances in countless surveys, the structural differences still persist. So for years we've been offering roadmaps and action plans that have met with passing interest and occasional enthusiasm. For the most part, the roadmaps are lost in an ambition for example, women to educate all boys. They are instinctive, such as instructing women to do this or look like that or respond like this, and they're unscrutinised. So our work is largely self-referencing, but not subject to age, academic rigour and evaluation. The so far, that's all we've got. And our responses appear to me to be highly conceptualised and little vague, without the motivation of regulation and consequences for failure. As a broad observation, we've made brave commitments, but we still rely on individuals to complain and then we respond to the individual case. So my question tonight for all of you is how do we harness the potency of the Me Too movement to create real change? It's not about a lack of will, although we could be better organised. The voice of women lawyers, local women lawyers associations and Australian women lawyers remain volunteer organisations without the support of continuous funding. They are excluded from the formal governing structures of the profession. They are offered support and sponsorship from time to time by the peak bodies and firms, but essentially they are hand to mouth depending on the efforts of the members and its board of tireless volunteers. It's not about a lack of surveys, although well, surprisingly I have to confess that when the Law Council results were shared with the Queensland Bar, the response of the day was to suggest the data set from Queensland was too small to reflect the position accurately in Queensland. And when I then produced a discrete analysis of appearances in Queensland Superior Court based on the court's own published data, another reason was found to justify an action. 
So this would blame the old argument about merit coming from those who've never experienced the unfair discrimination we heard as well. It isn't a case about the lack of laws and codes of conduct. So 70 years ago, the UN Declaration and the Declaration on Human Rights promised us equality. And in that time, we have seen hundreds of conventions, treaties, resolution and dialogue. We've seen significant milestones in Australia with the passing of um, CEDAW, introduced into Australian law in 1979 as the Sex Discrimination Act, which prohibits discrimination, vilification and harassment. The law now recognises, in case you don't know what I'm talking about, that sexual harassment may include these kinds of unwelcome acts. Physical contact, touching, hugging, what's known as cornering, which is rigging you up against the wall, kissing, swearing or leering, sexual gestures, suggestive sounds, comments or jests, intrusive questioning about personal lives, requests or pressure for sexual acts, explicit comments and inappropriate advances in emails, messages and social media, and sharing or threatening to share intimate images without consent. Those notorious sceptics. We've seen developments in international law, including the significant findings of the International Criminal Tribunal of Rwanda and former Yugoslavia, declaring rape acts of genocide and then rape and enslavement crimes made crimes against humanity. And likewise, in Australia, we've seen hundreds of pieces of legislation seeking to support and promote women's human rights. For the lawyers, the national legal professional model conduct rules were introduced and adopted by various states and territories through 2013 to 14, which included a, a new rule, Rule 123, prescribing harassment, bullying and vilification. Now, this was actually a mighty fight at the time, I should add, to include that rule in the inclusion, uh, to include the bullying harassment rule within the national conduct rules. And push that came, as you might predict, from uh, a defendant's mentality, one of prove it and don't over regulator, rather than one that actually refuted the existence of this conduct. And if I can share a brief anecdote with you, I remember after successfully persuading the Law Council directors to adopt the new rule, the night after the meeting, I was bailed up by two male directors, accusingly asking me, what am I supposed to do when she walks around the firm with her insert appropriate hair bows and short skirt, etc. It was actually said a little more crassly than that, as you can imagine. <laughs> so we now have a national charter, and we have, as I said, national action plans and countless tools for prevention, processes and response. And yet the attitude, that attitude of what are we supposed to do about it unsurprisingly persists. And as I've posited, the context is one in which structural persistent inequality continues for women. It's not because we're lacking evidence, including the first hand first accounts. And if you indulge me for a moment, I want to give you a taste of things that I have actually experienced myself or had reported to me. And I admit that some of these things at the time flawed me. And if I, a powerful, educated and sometimes intelligent person who understands my rights and have a voice, was flawed, imagine how someone less empowered than me or vulnerable by reason of personal trauma or personal circumstances might react. So here's a few examples. The governor colleague's tough advocacy on behalf of her client, but she just needs a good chat. Regarding raising diversity issues and equality issues in place of an action and apathy, you've got equality, the war is over, give it up, this is who's in me now. On telling a silk no, I was not interested in having him tell the solicitor to pull the brief, I just can't work with frigid women. After success in court, you're only one because the judge likes your insert anatomical reference. Your hoss, I can't help it. Placing his hand on my bottom, I was very aggressive with him in that case, to which I responded, like you're being now. I fell in love with her, I couldn't help it. So these are all examples of verbal sexual harassment, or certainly unwelcome conduct. But I have actually seen women, distressed by receiving the stalking emails and dick pics, having the unwelcome hands on their shoulders, or frozen in panic at the hand on a leg under the table at a social event, frightened after being pressed against walls, 
were locked in chambers after hours. Only a fortnight ago, saying goodnight to someone I'd exchanged no more than a dozen words with at a professional dinner, as I put out my hand to say goodnight, then pulled in for a kiss on the mouth, and only my lightning reflexes had to turn my teeth and come up and tell you. So the reason for telling you about this list is to reveal the truth that most of us have a list. And when you contemplate that fact, and the fact that your colleagues might not be telling you about what it is that you have experienced, you realise how tragic it is that we all do, and that this is our workplace that we come to work for every day. And I want to ask, particularly the men in the room, although I acknowledge that men have been on the end of this conduct too, I want to ask the men in the room, did you know that nearly every woman in this room has a list like this? It's perplexing to me that men say, continually my colleagues say to me, that they find it hard to believe, or that women they know have never reported experience in such things. And I want you to consider that you might not be the first person they confide in. But it's worth examining our first reaction to hearing that a woman has been harassed or bullied. When you experience the sense of distaste that you're no doubt feeling at the moment, the, oh my God, if only I'd known. That discomfort, unfortunately, hasn't translated into action. A number might think, well, it's not that bad. A few might think, how did you encourage that? Some might think, perhaps, he just misunderstood the truth, or cues. A not infrequent reaction to hearing a complaint is to treat the woman who's actually complained as though she's betrayed uh, the collegial nature of the profession itself. And she somehow, transformed by her complaint, becomes uh, the angry harridan who seeks to take all men down. Another common complaint is to say, well, how dare you, who's too big to fool? Uh, it will know that the client wants to retain his services or politicians, judges, mayors, school principals, captains of industry should somehow not be held to account for what must surely be a minor indiscretion. In confronting the issue at the bar over many years, I've been told point blank, that's not how we do things. We don't go public with these things. We circle the wagons, we speak blank, frankly and bluntly to the men involved. The problem, of course, is when you circle the wagons, you leave the woman who's affected outside the circle and with no response to her complaint. And this is even more so, I acknowledge, for issues overlaid of gender, race, religion, age, disability and culture. More challenging even are there cultural issues that persist, which consist openly in many places, that women and girls are less worthy than men. And my work on the International Bar Association and Diversity Council is revealing this with shocking detail. We know that globally women face violence, trafficking, exploitation, forced marriage, dowry murder and honour abuse. And worldwide we see women targeting the conflict. We hear presidents openly boast of their unconsensual sexual advances or describing women as too ugly for rape with impunity. This occurs in a context where globally women are displaced and disadvantaged with lip service being paid for meeting the Sustainable Development Goals. One recent shocking example from the law again, in Uta Pradesh, the first female chair of a regional bar council in India was murdered by a colleague two days after taking on the new role. It appears her murder was in protest at a woman's success. Now, I'm certain that the list of women practicing in those countries is many times greater than my own and their needs for support is even greater. Women's networks can be invaluable and non, a non-confronting step in these countries, although when we first created the Women Barristers Association in Victoria in 1993, graffiti appeared on our meeting notice with saying, ladies bring a place. Through global firms and multinational organisations and the membership bodies representing them, the bars and law societies, there's an opportunity for us to create a culture of courtesy, respect and encouragement. 
So I ask you to reflect on your own profession and your own professional circles to ask where that opportunity might lie. So I want to add some ideas about what's next that are gradually being teased out now and are worthy of further research and support. The first is the idea of compulsory training with real consequences for failure. Now we've been urging education as a solution for a long time, even investing in professional training tools like tools around unconscious bias. But despite the evidence that these tools do work to reduce the incidence of bullying and harassment, training seems to remain optional in the law at least. When the medical profession faced their own Me Too crisis a few years back, they decided, as the lawyers said, that training was essential. But instead of our gently, gently approach, we'll take people with us, they did two things. They mandated, what the colleges did, education for all practicing doctors. And they introduced consequences for failure. If a training hospital could not demonstrate it met certain training benchmarks within a certain time, they lost their accreditation as a training hospital. Three hospital departments have now lost the right to employ train uh, junior employees for junior doctors. West Mills Hospital ICU, St George's Hospital ICU and the Royal Prince Alfred Cardiothoracic Unit. The College of Surgeons and the College of Intensive Care control uh, the accreditation process uh, for training for junior doctors. And their view was, we control this, we control this area of um, influence, our junior doctors are entitled to a safe workplace, what we're doing and it's totally is completely unacceptable, so here's what we'll do. So, those three units have 12 months or so before the next round of accreditation to get them back and to say to their senior consultants, if you don't undertake this training, then we will face another year of loss of our junior doctors. Now imagine that the same rule applies to law firms or the senior counsel needing to work with juniors. The profit model of the law firms and the reputational impact would quickly drive change, I suggest. The second issue I want to acknowledge is what we call the pushback. The failure of some very high profile cases, including those not initiated by the victim, has led to an inevitable pushback. And for every Me Too story is a hashtag not all men story to try to navigate issues of global responsibility. Over the last two weeks, describing the RBA survey results from different seminars, the first questions have been young men anxious and don't know how they're supposed to behave, or older men confused about how to flirt or court as one um, man expected. So I do recognise that relationships are messy and people do form consensual relationships at work. What we're describing, however, is unwelcome and unlawful, so the encouragement for those young men is to be sure and be double sure. What's needed here is for men and for women to recognise that vocalising your reaction actually shifts attention away from the person affected and creates a new class of victims those potentially wrongfully accused with an implicit demand for absolution or exception. And what we need to introduce is an understanding of this notion of enthusiastic consent. Consent that's explicit and clear that's beyond doubt. Who can doubt? Ask. And some rules for the confused. Looking at you is not an invitation. Wearing clothes is not an offering. Taking your hand does not mean kiss me, silence is not consent, and even having sex is not consent to having sex again. So yes, we should be investing in those sort of education that people are craving. The third issue is the role of the active bystander, and there is a champion role for all of us here as active bystanders. This can range from the immediate intervention, what are you doing, what did you say, don't say that, and or even, what are you doing, that's not okay. And you can judge the appropriateness or the harshness of the intervention based on the situation. And when I ask my daughters, who are both in their 20s and both entering the workforce, how they deal with this or inappropriate comments, they say exactly that, they say, what, so, what? 
And then, so most of them, there's no repetition because people are uh, uh, rebuked, gently, but they are rebuked. I used to say to the barrister readers as they were coming in to the uh, readers course that the best way to address the situation is the witty put down. Because what you're doing is reclaiming the power in the situation. But I would then say if you can't think of that on the run, fuck off. <laughs> so, my advice is that you look out for each other and practice some standard interventions so they become these instinctive circuit breakers. We need to make it safe for men to check in with each other and be told you crossed the line. We shouldn't be tolerating the boys should be told philosophy, despite all those hating on the Gillette ad and the notion of toxic, toxic masculinity. This is really a thing where men need guidance from each other because that's ultimately who they're going to listen to. And our boys are looking for help navigating the expectations of adult relationships just as our girls are. We need to recognise that respectful relationships are not always demonstrated at home and our kids need role models at school, at work and at play. So I really need to ask you, and the AWR has been urging this notion of the active bystander, that we all need to be brave people, to listen and be allies to women and recognise the courage it takes to describe a distressing event. The last thing I want to say is that we actually need to redesign the system. If we make it a mandatory aspect of occupational health and safety laws for employers to provide safe workplaces, free from bullying and harassment, just like they're currently obligated to provide a workplace that's free of all sorts of risks, we shift the owners from the individual complainants to the bosses to create a better system for all of us. Design systems, we need to design systems where women can report informally as well as formally if they wish to, to access the wise advice and sometimes just get things off their chest without having to take it further. And to access pro bono legal, social and psychological services and advice. Now after today, a group of you, particularly this might be something Griffith University want to take up, a group of law students might establish a free service to victims of sexual harassment, offering services to women's legal services and Me Too campaigns. But most of all, we need to keep at it. Me Too is the momentum for saying it out loud. So wear your pussy grabber beanies, march in the street, organise your support group and make sure your voices are heard to demand safe workplaces for us all. Thank you. Mm-hmm.